You like comics? You bet we do. How about artwork? Yeah, we fucking love that too. You like movies? Whether they are old or new. How about streaming? We watch that fucking shit, it's true. But it's comic book art that gets us all fired up for the all time great. So let's buckle up. Hear me out, I'ma tell you how it all goes down on the blacklist. Underground. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Blacklist Underground, brought to you by Ideal Organic CBD, starring our favorite artist, Zach Howard. Hi, Zach. Hola. Zach's oh. creator of the hit series, Wild Blue Yonder, as well as illustrator of The Cape, Hellboy, Judge Dread, TMNT, and too many others to mention. I'm your host, enthusiastic comic book aficionado, J.C. Washburn. And each episode, we choose a comics legend to ink a drawing of, and this week's giant, who's getting blacklisted, is none other than Philip Bond, whose unique style has influenced a generation of artists and deviants alike. This week, we welcome our special guest, Tess Fowler, whose work has been featured in Rat Queens, Charmed, Broken Bones, and her webcomic, The Rascals. Zach, hit us up with our Patreon blacklisters this week. Phil Boyd, back to the show. <laughs> Uh, Tess, I usually like to start out the show with a quote from the artist that we're blacklisting. Um, and uh, Philip doesn't have a lot of quotes floating around on the internet, but nope. I found I did find one quote that seems like it's appropriate to almost every artist that we've interviewed. He said, I'm not the fastest artist, and I don't think there's an editor out there who would take on a book with me penciling and inking. <laughs> <laughs> so Tess, uh, welcome to the show. Thank Let's, you. Uh, I think uh, it, you told us uh, this is the uh, first podcast you've done. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have spent a lot of years um, avoiding cameras, avoiding social situations, and just drawing. We just go where the conversation takes us. Uh, uh, case in point, last time we recorded uh, with Dave Johnson, it delved into a 20-minute conversation about porn Thanksgiving that uh, both That's JC right. and Dave Johnson has attended personally. Did yeah. you say porn Thanksgiving? Porn Thanksgiving. That so, sounds very on brand for Dave. Adult adult actors, a lot of them don't have a good, you know, a a, um, a secure place to go uh, for holidays, oh. so they get to, they get together. I never thought of that. That's totally cool. And it turns out that the stories that they share are some of the most interesting stories you'll ever hear. <laughs> you would think, you know yeah. Man. Here yeah. in LA. There's a lot of folks in the business, um, so you, you do you do hear a lot of tales. That does make a lot of sense. So well, uh, it was very interesting. Your intro for for me is such old stuff. I I <laughs> have, I have tended to in the past few years um, circumvent any kind of uh, real self promotion. I've kind of just lived on Twitter. Yeah. Um, so my website literally has not been updated, I think, in like <laughs> 10 years. I just you're, yeah, you're, you're, a, you're a tough one. You're a tough, a tough one, to, a tough nut to crack, but um, yeah. I, your, work, your artwork is gorgeous. Thank you. You want to tell us your uh, journey in the art a little bit, uh, however you want to go about that? What You know why? Because I think you and I are kind of in the same place now, though, doing different things. We just do our own thing and give zero shit sure. about the uh, comic book industry, correct? Yeah, I think so. I think so. You're in the, I saw uh, something you posted recently um, about being independent that was a little salty. And I was like, well, yes. <laughs> yeah. I quit any kind of mainstream work in um, January, 2020. And I've been doing some interesting things. Um, uh, I, I did work on Rat Queens for a little bit. I worked with Shelly Bonds, Philip Bonds, this guy, his wife. Um, she was my editor for a new imprint at IDW uh, for a little while. Actually, you know, the two of you guys have something in common, and I don't know if you realize this. So, But Tess's favorite character, movie character, is Zula from Conan the Destroyer. <laughs> <laughs> And and Zach is is uh, is a, is well known as the biggest Conan fan in comics, maybe except for Dan Panosian. Yeah, we'll have to fight it out one day, but uh, okay. I'll be entertaining. I, I think I'm a pretty big contender for that crown. I'm uh, just yeah. saying. I can even uh, uh, do quotes from uh, your character, and I haven't seen that movie in probably 20 years. 
Just grab them and take them. Just take them. Just take them. That is that Robert is Jordan fun. actually wrote the book that that's based on. If you know who Robert Jordan is, he wrote The Wheel of Time. If you know who Robert Jordan is, who do you think you're talking to? An American. They don't read books. So, uh, <laughs> they're like Robert Jordan, which, which season of Bachelor did he lose? But he also, wow. I, think, I think Roy Thomas did the screenplay, didn't he? He did, he did, and, and made it kind of a comedy, right? Yeah, it was pretty lighthearted, but as a kid, that was fine with me. Yeah, I still was happy in the theater. As an adult, I was a little sad, but, you know, you want to see King Conan, but... Uh, Wait, Zach, uh, how old are you? I'm 46. I just turned uh, a ripe old age of 46. Okay. So I look 72, 40, people say. I, I'm turning 40 this year. So oh, wow. I, I was a baby with Conan. Like Conan the Destroyer was was something I watched when I was really little. So me, it, it's kind of like the the whole Ewok argument, you know? <laughs> yes. You know, for me, Ewoks were everything. Right. So yeah, I loved I'm, them as a kid too. Yep. Let's see. All right. How I am I going to watch die? the Ewok show? Remember that short lived thing? I did. It, I, I'll, I'll tell you guys a story that I've never told anyone. Uh oh. But um, what did Warwick Davis do to you? Yeah. <laughs> We've had the Warwick conversation. But um, when I was a kid, my dad uh, lived at this um, spiritual commune on the weekends. It was called the Abode of the Message. Nice. And, um, <laughs> he's, a, he's, he's a total hippie. And so. Um, they had a they had a donation box there, and uh, we stole the donation box. <laughs> and it was the year it was the summer that Re that Return of the Jedi came out, and uh, ET. And we so we with all of our with all this money that we stole, we went and saw Return of the Jedi. I I mean I must have seen it a dozen times that summer, with the stolen church money. <laughs> nice classic, bro. I well, was never, it, was, it was never discovered. I never, I know ne nobody knows to this day. Yeah, tax free organization. I, yeah. I say you worked out just fine for them. Well, I'll have to pay for it in the afterlife, probably. But you tell St. Peter, look, dude. But, <laughs> but I, I, the Ewoks to me, awesome. The whole movie. I, I, I mean, to me, that's still my favorite. Uh, I Jedi? have taken so much damn shit about Ewoks because, like, when Chris and I met, um, Back in the day, we met at San Diego Comic Con. He was dressed up like Boba Fett. Nice. <laughs> it was it was only my second ever convention, but I took to costuming with him. And this was back before any kind of you know nerd women's lib or anything. So I had so many <laughs> dude gatekeepers who gave me so much crap about loving Ewoks, and I would run circles around them, you know, because fuck them. Um, but Star Wars was my religion as a kid. Star Wars was my, you know, when people ask, do you believe in God? Like, no, I, I believe in something, you know, similar to the force. I was yeah. that nerd. I'm with I'm you. <laughs> I'm totally with you. I think that's still my religion. Exactly. I, uh, Tess, how do you, I, I have this problem. I grew up a Star Wars freak, even got to do some Star Wars covers. I was all jazz, but the more popular Star Wars became, and I hate being this jerk, the less I enjoyed it uh, because the fandom just kind of overpowered my love for it and then mixed with, you know, some some movies that I didn't exactly enjoy. I think I may have been too old for them. I don't know. Uh, but it just kind of, over the years, my, my love for it has diminished greatly uh, to me, kind of seems watered down right now, and more like a. Uh, I mean, you, maybe you ran into this being a, a true fan, but you just kind of—it's become its own little, like little cult thing. Where uh, I don't well, know, it's just it, it, when something becomes too popular, I don't always dismiss it, but uh, it. it be, I don't know. Star Wars did it for me, where I was just like, whatever. I'm gonna go watch Star Trek. I don't care about Baby Yoda. Um, <laughs> Where okay, 20 but years ago, I would have hyper Zach has not seen The Mandalorian. I was um, just going to ask that because, okay, Zach, seriously, as, as you, you got to give it a shot. 
at least. I know, I know it's good, but now so many people say it's good, and I see, like, Baby Yoda. You know how artists kind of chase the dragon, whatever's popular? They yes. Deadpool's out, they do Deadpool commissions. If Yoda's out, Yoda butthole commissions. Uh, well, I don't know what, star, what people get for Yoda commissions, but I assume it involves his butthole. But... Uh, <laughs> Um, or as Cloaca, as we established on PG-13. Um, but, uh, I mean, because you know Yoda has a Cloaca, right? Um, but I almost enjoy fucking with Star Wars fans more than I enjoy watching anything Star Wars. Um, and not because you I haven't just seen taste. the Mandalorian, dude. I know it's supposed to be great, but at this point, I can't. It's like you that. have to divorce yourself from the fandom. This is the thing I keep telling people. Fandoms ruin everything. True. You have to, you're a storyteller. You're a creator. You're an artist. You would so appreci appreciate the way this thing has been put together. Granted, there's a little bit of, you know, nostalgia callback in it, of course. Which they have to, yeah. I, I dig it. It's cool. The basic underlying premise of it is something that I greatly appreciate. And for me, Mandalorian is so much closer to what I fell in love with about Star Wars to begin with. Yes. Um, to me, it's, it's, it's pure storytelling. And I love the arc of, you know, a complete bastard, an asshole who learns to, to find his heart, who learns about the meaning of life. And him, this, this brutal mercenary um, or someone who had, you know, been attempting to be a br brutal mercenary and had been fairly successful at it, finding this innocent child and learning, uh, oh, oh, no, oh, no, fuck everybody else. This is my baby now. Yep. It's so beautiful. <laughs> and that is so worth the ride, man. And also Bad Batch. I've heard good things. I haven't checked it out yet. Oh, Bad Batch is fucking phenomenal, dude. Like, That's what I heard. but I'm very much into like the the military camaraderie kind of stories, and this is very much that. So I've always loved those too. I nothing makes me more jazz than you know the band of brothers type of story. And uh, that's it. it 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 gets me going. That's why I love Conan because ultimately it's a lesson and you can't do life by yourself. Yeah. You know, you yeah. gotta have friends. Yeah. And, uh, uh, exactly. But, I will see the Mandalorian. I'm not anti-Mandalorian. I'm just anti, uh, uh, I don't know, to your point, fans. It just, even my own, like, even when I draw something popular, it starts getting to me where I don't even read it anymore or look at it. Same. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with me, but uh, same. No, I'm the exact same way. There's nothing wrong with you. Well, it, that's, it, that's why they call it guilty pleasures. You know what I mean? <laughs> I get it, but you know, I don't. I'm. Oh, this is gross to say. I just basically read or listen to audio books now, and I I watch so few movies, um, and I don't even know why. I just find that's what I do now, and I love movies, but. I usually will just have Gladiator or something on the background while I work if I do watch yeah, a movie. For me, it's it's Sopranos much of the time. Yeah. Ah, crime. It's like comfort food in a way. <laughs> exactly. Have you seen the new trailer for Sopranos, by the way, for the new I, movie? I did see the um, – I saw I saw it listed, but I, I, I didn't watch it, but it looked like they had the guy from The Punisher in there. Yeah, he's playing He's playing, playing uh, Johnny Boy. I don't know how well you know Sopranos. Ah, cool. Yeah, he's playing Johnny Boy, but the whole thing is Tony is a teenager, and yeah. it's played by his kid. Yeah, <laughs> and awesome. He looks just like him. So Good image, it's, right? Yeah, it's it's Tony and Dicky Moldasanti. Oh wow! Yeah, so you get to see Dicky do all kinds of the all the fucked up legendary shit that you heard about in the show. You get to see him do all of it. It's really cool. Good. Yeah, Good. That was, um, that's is Baby Yoda in it. Yeah. Fuck you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what was that word you used for Yoda's butthole, dude? Cloaca. That's uh, what birds and lizards have. You poop and shit out of the same hole. You, or you pee and shit out of the same hole. Okay. Cloaca. 
I mean, you know, Tony Soprano's probably got a cloaca in this one. <laughs> oh if not, he's seen his fair share of cloaca and knows his way around <laughs> one. Man. Speaking ill of the quick. dead, sir. That is horrible. I'm sorry. I got to lean into it. I love Star, Star Wars growing up and everything like that. I just... <laughs> The more people get pissy pants when you make fun of something, the more I got to do it because they get so serious about stuff you shouldn't get serious about. Oh, no, um, feel free because I'm just going to give you a ration of shit. That's all. You could. That's what I want. But <laughs> I do want to uh, 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 dovetail or digress back into it. I'm really curious about your journey as getting into the industry, then getting out, and you're kind of you, – you've had one hell of a ride. And uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about it, if possible. All right. Let me I'll, I'll give you the short version. Um, I believed in the comic industry and getting into comics so much because as a kid, I used to be like, oh, my God, comics can save the world. Comics can change the world. I was that kid. And awesome. getting in, uh, I was like, oh, th this is full of assholes <laughs> who just want to fuck. Like, OK. I just was not prepared for the 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 boys club. Yeah. I was not because I came in a purist. You know, oh man, it's about the art. It's about the honor of it. It's about the integrity of it. Fuck love that. based. You, you had a love for it and wanted to Such take part in love. that. And I still do. I still very much do. I love. I love it as a medium. I love it as a storyteller. I still because it's pure. not comic. It's not the comic book industry. The medium isn't. Yeah, exactly. And I knew I needed, I knew I wanted to work. I felt like I had something to prove. So I took whatever job came to me, whatever job came my way. The first one, first published work was um, like a, a, what was it? Blue, Blue Water, Michelle Obama. That oh, was my first yeah, that was my first actual comic book way, way back in the day. They do all um, the political books, even like Stephen Colbert or something I think he did. I don't know. Yeah, like, all the unauthorized biographies. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, but before that, uh, my fir very first published work was Heavy Metal Magazine. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was how I got in. Um, I used to hang out on the Heavy Metal boards and one day told a story about Ninja Turtles because I was a huge Ninja Turtles fan. And Kevin... I've seen your childhood picture. It's one of my favorite childhood pictures of all time. I must confess. <laughs> best. With your turtle shirt and everything. It was awesome. Or, did, did you see where I was actually dressed up as Michelangelo? Yes, that was a great one too. It's, yeah. uh, but I'll let you carry on. You just you <laughs> no, posted some, some wonderful shots of you as a tight took some very serious ribbing for that as a child did not care <laughs> stand proud exactly um but no he was like wow he's like you know he goes somebody like you you really need to go to san diego comic-con and i was like the what didn't even know what he was talking about i grew up in northern california didn't even know it existed um so he was like hey tell you what you get yourself down here to san diego on such and such date i'll let you work the heavy metal booth i'll pay you all you oh, got to wow. do is get here. Yeah. So I managed to uh, migrate my way down there, uh, which is a story in and of itself. <laughs> um, got there, and it was Kevin. It was Simon Bisley. It was <laughs> pinup artist Lorenzo Sperlonga and uh, painter Alex Horley. Oh, wow. Yeah, with his wife, Stacy Walker. And, occasionally, Aria Giovanni. Oh, my gosh. So, I was like, I'm in heaven. I'm never leaving. <laughs> Nerd City welcomed me with open arms. Um, I ended up spending a couple nights in a, a chair in a Marriott lobby. Because I had nowhere to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, it was I've the done that. Nothing I've done things like that, too. I love it. Yeah. Love to hear it. Hell, yeah. And uh, what ended up happening was Simon Bisley, who was drinking pretty hardcore at the time. What? Uh, I've never exactly. heard Simon drinking stories. Exactly. Um, 
he was telling his fans uh, that he was going to do things to my backside. Oh. He was pointing me out what? and telling his fans all the things he was going to do to me. And Stacy Walker mm. came over and she goes, if you stay in his room, she was like, I, I don't know if you're going to come out again. She was like, don't do it. You're, you know, you're starry eyed. You think everybody's, you know, really yeah. sweet and lovely. They're not. She gave me my first talk and I was like, oh, how, seriously, I, I would never sleep with, you know, one of the art greats. No, I'm going to be an art great. I was so young. And uh, <laughs> so she was like, you know, find somewhere else to stay. And so I, I, you know, I stuck with my Marriott chair, but that was my start. And Kevin and Howie, who used to run the magazine, were like, oh, you're an artist? Like, hey, you get us this many paintings together, we'll put you, we'll put you up a gallery. So went home that whole year, painted. I didn't know how to paint, taught myself to paint just so I could be in heavy metal. And that was it. And then Tone Rodriguez of Garage Art Studios back in the day um, kind of took me under his wing and took me to my first like working show. He gave me part of his table in Texas. And uh, that's where I met God, everyone. Um, drove down there with him from California or from Los Angeles. And uh, he showed me the ropes. He showed me, you know, you you give kids a, uh, a free sketch if they come up for a sketchbook. Um, this is how much you charge for regular sketches. This is how you sell your stuff. This is how, you know, how much prints go for. Like he taught me everything. And then he got me into sketch cards. So I was doing like 500, you know, women of Marvel sketch cards at a time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Legit. It was like that. And uh, it was cool. It was it was it was cool. It was tiring, but I had the energy for it. And then moved out to LA and ended up working on Rat Queens for a little while. And that pretty much launched everything. Um, Twitter blew up, uh, social media blew up, and then you know started getting gigs here and there. Since then, I did Kid Lobotomy with Peter Milligan and Shelly Bond. And that's where I met Philip Bond. Um, and just learned so much from the little bit I got to see of him working. Awesome. He, he was hugely inspiring. And I worked, oh God, I've done so many odd jobs in between that. Like I, I worked for Netflix, um, did some work for a family on YouTube called the bucket list family. Um, that's Garrett G, who uh, like multimillionaire, and he huh. takes his wife and kids all around the world. They stay in like the giraffe manor. They swim with sharks. <laughs> cool. Weird, yeah, weird shit like that. I did an album cover for Lisa Loeb. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've had such random jobs. Um, and then, those, are really, those are the cool stories, though. If you just said, I did Green Lantern for 16 issues, uh, and then I switched over to Supergirl for 16 issues, and then did Superman, uh, you know, <laughs> Superman, the uh, Dark Cloaca saga. Um, <laughs> exactly. Lisa Loeb does children's music now. Like, when, yep. you, when you ask Alexa to, for, like, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, it's always Lisa Loeb's version. That's so cool. Yeah. She, I met her just as she, as she had had her second kiddo. And I actually did the art for the album, but I also did the art for the lyric video. Cool. Um, so I went to her house and met her kids and her husband and stuff. And she Super was really cool. rad. Yeah, she was really rad. And then I did um, d and I did a DD and d comic for a little bit, which was really fun. One IDW? of those Job in the Dream. What was that? Was that for IDW? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Just curious. Awesome. No, and then, uh, then I quit. And then I got cancer. And now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, health-wise, you're, you seem, you've had all the journey there, Tess, uh, from the little I actually know empirically. How are you feeling nowadays? Uh, doing pretty good. I've had a couple, you know, weird side issues. Basically, um, 
I quit January 2020 to do my own comics. And, you know, I had had so many, so much weird harassment over the years from like right wing fascist yeah. bullshit. And uh, I was tired and I was like, ah, I'm going to get out. You know, I had d d It's what I wanted since I was little. I'm going to do my own thing. I've I've been wanting to do my own thing for forever. So got out in January. In February, I found the lump and ended up I had triple positive uh, stage zero, stage one breast cancer. Aww. And um, I uh, back in the day, man, like I had the biggest gazongas. <laughs> like, they were they were fucking monster like sideshow huge. <laughs> and uh, so the fact that I even <laughs> found it, my doctor was like, how the hell? Did you find this tiny little lump in all of this? I was like, I know, right? Um, <laughs> Needle on a haystack? Exactly, exactly. It was like that. Um, and I was chubby. I was living that, like, comic book artist life of, you know, bad food, sugar, and deadlines. Bohemian um, life. A bohemian production life is exactly. how I describe it. Exactly. Um Let's see. There we go. Just make sure you're still on camera. Um, hmm. So it was just one of those, like, really, universe? Really? So <laughs> also found out I was high risk. Uh, I was, I have a genetic P10 disorder, which means I'm high risk for, like, 90, I'm 90% high risk for, like, six different kinds of cancer. Yeesh. Yeah. So they told me that shit. And since that time, I have had chemo i have had a double mastectomy oh um which is a blessing an absolute blessing i wish i'd done it sooner um i did not cry whatsoever when i went in to see the surgeon the first time before i even knew exactly what i had i was like oh we're doing mastectomy he was like what no no he's like we, you know we can conserve the breast we can have just a lumpectomy i was like no trust me i was like this is gonna come back mastectomy and when I came back to see him after getting the diagnosis, I was like, told ya. <laughs> it's funny, it, uh, it's funny you can say that. But my wife went through the same thing. And they said, um, they said they actually were, had, had, are now, for some breast cancers, are leaning towards lumpectomies uh, because it, in case it comes back, it gives them a, a second shot at it. You know what I mean? Uh, and for me, because of my uh, genetic P10 disorder, the, the, um, my oncologist was like, you need to go full mastectomy. Yep. You need to have a, a hysterectomy. Whoa. He was like, I want you to keep your ovaries, you know, just cause you're so young. Um, you can have them out later if you want. Um, and then they wanted to medically shut down my ovaries. So wow. yeah, they were like for the next year to five years, you're going to be coming into this office. You're going to get a shot you know, once a month, you're going to get not only chemo, but you're going to get, uh, what is it called? Um, targeted treatment because I was also HER2 positive. This is a lot of terminology. Sorry. Um, but they were like, your, your life's about to really change. And I'm so thankful for it. I know that sounds weird, but it changed my life. And now the comic I'm working, the comic I was working on changed and because I started making comics about the cancer while mm. I was sick. And this past month or so, I took everything I'd been working on this past year, scrapped the old stuff, and went straight for the cancer stuff. Mm. So now I'm doing a book, not a sad book. I don't like that sad shit. <laughs> you know, it's not my style. I'm talking about the cancer. I'm talking about this 2020. Because there is such a silver lining in the curse. It sucked, sure, but I've learned so much about myself. My husband and I have gotten even closer than we were. It's That's amazing. amazing a perspective, uh, yeah. Tess, and how it's so unbelievably healthy, too. Because you've had one hell of a hand dealt, and I've watched you produce... Uh, strips and artwork that put things into perspective as you're working through it. It's just been as a fan of you, both uh, inspirational to watch you conquer it, but also your evolution and honesty and 
and everything like that because most most people can't quite get that type of uh perspective with something you've gone through it, they become Thanks, bitter or, or uh they they just they, i don't know they need to be placated emotionally and uh yeah. it's been fun it's been wild watching you turn that into a creative output which i think i wish more people would do if they can harness that i mean yeah. it takes a certain type of strength from you but uh uh and ability but it's been admirable and inspiring watching you do it thank you thanks for saying that man thanks. no it's been it's crazy because a lot of my uh <laughs> i'll run into nurses i've had to have um an echocardiogram, which is where they examine your heart. I've had to have that one of those every three months. My first one, I cried. I used to be so anxious about needles, about doctors, about everything. By the last one, I came in, threw my shirt off, and the lady was trying to put a little cover on me. I was like, girl, I was like, there's no titties. I'm good. Like, <laughs> let me lay down hit me and you know she got me with the goo and she was like you're so positive i was like i'm still alive yep you that's know wonderful perspective yeah that's, that's all that matters i'm still alive I, i'm you still to you. still be part of the uh party going on exactly well it's you know i i always research the artist you know before we do the shows and so i i i got to the video where uh Van Scriver and those guys were sort of mocking your condition. Yup. And I had never, I knew that those guys were scumbags just from what I had heard around, but watching that made me so physically angry I, that, that people could actually record themselves saying such horrible things about another human being. Uh, anyways, I commend you for getting through that and for not uh, having those guys uh, put to death there. You know, have had your husband, you know, beat the shit out of him at a con or something. I mean, Honestly, was Chris has had such a hard time because those guys have been coming after me since about 2016, 2017. Yeah, it's, and the it's, shit that they have pulled, I mean, has almost hit my husband harder than me. Yeah. Be I can't even I wouldn't, imagine. Yeah, I wouldn't rise to the bait the way they wanted me to. I was real covert about it. Um, <laughs> I, I would warn people. I would get people undercover. I would teach them how to chain block because back in the day when it first started, they had the element of surprise and it was scary. It was really scary because we didn't know what they were going to do. And it just tr got to a point because they came after me even during chemo. I, well, that's when you, I think you and I started talking even more because I said, I'm going to chip the fucking teeth out of their mouth. If they say one more word to you, yeah. uh, I mean, we we don't even know each other very well, but I was fucking done uh, with those guys. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do not like bullies. And then number two, a person that's going through the hell you are. Yeah. Uh, I, I I just oh my god. I I mean, I, I, I honestly, I don't care if somebody here. threatens me, but I was done when they started <laughs> really getting scary with you there. Yeah. I mean, there's stuff they did that I've never made public just because I won't give them the power. I can't even imagine. I, I won't do it. And I mean, there was stuff at New York Comic Con where uh, a couple of them showed up and I had to get people undercover. I had to get them off the open floor. Um, and That's funny because they don't show up with Dan Panosian and I, but just nope. Tess Fowler. Yep. <laughs> And that shows you that what type of humans they are. Exactly. You know, they've tried to come for my integrity. They've tried to come for my name. And the thing is, I was like, motherfucker, you ain't the first. You ain't going to be the last. Like, you're not, you're not going to make lies stick. You just can't. I, I, I've been through too much shit in my life. Like, you spreading lies about me isn't going to hurt my feelings. But the cancer video that you referenced... um. Oh. My husband was warned that it existed while I was sick and nobody told me hmm. until like a month later. I didn't know it existed. They, they were just like, we didn't know if you could handle it. You were so sick. And it pissed me off 
that they put, not that they did it, but that they put my husband in a position to feel like he had to protect me. Oh. That hurt me worse than anything. But honestly, the fact that they made that video and that clip exists has done more damage than I ever could to them. Right. Oh, they're done as far as uh, actual careers. They got to live with that bullshit the rest of their life being an evil bully to exactly. someone that's already a victim with uh, the luck and odds of just being alive. They got a rough hand dealt and you're taking a shit on them because they're a female and these types of guys feel that's an easy target, yep. you know, because uh, they say something to Dan Panosian, they're going to wake up looking for their teeth, you yep. know, uh, they say something to you, you know, there's a lot of degrees of uh, 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 danger that has to happen before they, they become accountable for what they're doing. Exactly. So, uh, exactly. But yeah, it's the unfortunate side of fandom and or some of the pros that, that took part in that because that's the exact opposite of what comic books are about. Comics right. are for everyone and all mediums and full expression is a, a direct line of, of voice from the creator to, you know, the viewer and or reader. And then you get uh, uh, shit lords like that. I mean, nuking the industry with their hate. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's unacceptable. It's you unacceptable. See, the thing is, man, the fact that I've got people in my DMs and always have, but now since cancer more so, I've got people who are like, hey, I just got diagnosed. And the fact that you were so open about it and like, you know, didn't go into hiding and took us on your journey, like has helped me face the, this diagnosis. That's so beautiful. Yep. That to me is, you know, a lot of my purpose to just speak and speak honestly and speak with honor and speak with integrity. And no matter what motherfucker crosses my path, I just have to stand strong, you know? That's what Amazing, matters. Tess. I'm not trying to just butter you up because you're our guest, but you're a true inspiration. You really are. Um, your strength, and this is just something I know from being around uh, leaders in my life, strength, people being strong around others for more altruistic reasons uh, rather than to be seen or just control people, it, it's noticeable by others to your point. And even, I don't even have cancer. I have an autoimmune disease and uh, a fraction of what you have to deal with. And I've, I've found uh, inspiration in your strength, yep. you know, and this right is on, something man. I've been dealing with for 25 years, but even now you handling things the way you did affects me, you know? Right. On, so man. I appreciate your strength. It, 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 it helps people in ways you probably don't even know. But I'm sure you do know to some extent. But uh, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I feel awkward now for rambling. But thank you. Well, <laughs> well Tess, you have you have kind of a unique, you know, window into this whole. I mean, I grew up on comic books, and to me, I I never really witnessed this whole this kind of misogynistic underbelly that has become so big now. And I don't know if that's a product of you know, people, you know, guy, you know, these guys, bitter guys who can't get laid and they get out that, you know, they're, they, they have all this hatred on the internet and they just have an outlet for it. But it's like, I mean, I'd always sort of heard the stories, you know, uh, but I never really understood the magnitude, especially in the comic book industry. I mean, yeah. it's, so, it's so prevalent. And as a fan, I was just enjoying my comic books. And now I'm reading the comments underneath. I'm like, my God, I'm, well, who, who 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 are my who are my brothers in arms here reading these comic books? These guys are monsters. Exactly, true monsters. <laughs> exactly, but that's that's that was the the disorienting part for me because I came in as such a you know I liked I liked the boy stuff. Yeah, I I wasn't really into the frills and the lace. I was I was into you know like we talked about Conan and Conan and stuff, right? Yeah. Well, so you liked, I thought you liked ElfQuest too, and I was a big ElfQuest reader when I was a kid as well. Huge ElfQuest fan oh, for life Elfquest, here, man. ElfQuest changed my life. ElfQuest was one of those <laughs> where 
I didn't feel like I belonged. And then I read that and I was like, oh, there, there is a place for me. I get it. Um, well, I saw, okay. I saw Chasing Amy. Yeah. And for me, that was so eye-opening because I was like, wait, there's a girl. Oh, mm -hmm. girls can do this. I didn't know. I, I thought I was going to have to do it, you know, in the closet as a hobby. I, I I always dreamed of making comics as a living. I didn't know you could just, you know, go ride a table or go drive a table for for pennies, live that, you know, punk artist life. Yeah. Yeah, but what yeah. I didn't realize was it was like 99 and that was over. You couldn't really yeah. do it the way you could in the 90s. So I was in for a rude awakening, but one thing that has held strong is I love the work. I love the work. I love making comics. That's never changed, and I'll never let anyone take it away from me. And and what a great introduction you had to have Kevin Eastman as your as your sort of initial window oh. into the industry. That guy opened a lot of doors for a lot of people. Oh, he took That's what me... he does, man. It, he's a good dude, huh? Great dude. dude. He took me to um, Meltdown here in L.A. Oh, the I... famous Meltdown, yeah. Yeah. He took me to Meltdown and he showed me, he took me through the racks and he said, see this right here? He showed me Black Sad. And he goes, this is going to be you one day. These are the kind of comics you're going to make. And I was like, what? I, you know, I wanted to work on Green Arrow. I was mm -hmm. like, what are you talking about? And lo and behold, I ended up a fucking watercolor painter <laughs> making watercolor comics. And I was like, holy shit. How did he know? Like, how did he just pin my trajectory like that? He just, he just did. He Wimbrun. had that kind of an eye. He was just, he's just such an open guy. And he's just got such a big heart. And he just loves comic books to his core. Yeah. Truly. That's all and the vibe I get from him. I, uh, I got to go to his house. Oh, cool, cool. And it was a it was a mausoleum, man. He had a sort of guy like house in Northampton or in L.A. In L.A. Oh. He sold that office, you know, like everything in it. I think. Yep, yep. I actually have pictures of me in his house and in his office, pretending so to work cool. at his desk. <laughs> it was all right, but he um, at the time when he was driving me, he looked at me and he goes, "You know, I love running heavy metal." He was like but I miss drawing. He goes, whatever you do, like, don't lose this passion that you have for the craft. He was like, don't lose it. He goes, cause that's what I miss the most is being able to draw every day. He goes, and all I want to do is get back to it. That's cool, man. Yeah. It's, it's funny though. Cause when I was a kid and I was hanging around at conventions and Eastman and Laird were the guests before, before all the bazillions of dollars and stuff showed up. You didn't have this. You didn't have this sort of dark undercurrent of, of you know the fans that I met there were all just sort of these gentle souls who loved comic books and were sort of shy and you know it was and now there's it's just sort of a something has changed in the fan base. I guess it goes back to what Zach was saying earlier. It's like the the fandom is sort of destroying things in a way. It is. Well, we're all a lot more connected now. Right? Yeah, you know, they got a voice now. They didn't. You know, you'd have to write into the Lawrence Welk show back in the day. Now you can go online exactly. while Lawrence Welk is is uh, shoulder shrugging and start taking a shit on him, yeah, or or saying anything really you want. You can just make things up. I mean, I don't know exactly. That's why you have uh, people picking on Tess uh, because those people didn't have a voice back in the day. But they're also they, it just seems like they're just mad at women. Like, they are. There's just this sort of weird raging misogyny that's happening in this country. And it's just sort of bizarre to me. But if you think about like, you know, the current topic is Britney Spears. Right. And how fun it was back in the day for people to be like, oh, this whore. Look at her. She's fucking nuts. It was fun for people. Yep. It was really, really fun. Yeah. And it always bothered me. It always upset me. It like, bothers me too. I like agree. the Tiger King shit. Tiger King came out and a all sociopath the shit. Uh, abusing yeah. animals is the number one show in uh, right. America. Yeah. And the whole, you know, him going after Carol Baskin, like 
tell me that doesn't sound like some comic book people we know. Seriously. Like, He's probably in Comics Gate and not doesn't even read comic books, I bet. Just the, because their hate overlaps so uh, perfectly. Exactly. So it's, it's, uh, it's weird to have been through as much as I have been through, to have taken so much shit and taken so many bullets, and I'm still standing. I'm basically fucking bulletproof now. You can't touch me. And yet there's still kids coming into this industry who don't know because the, the, the memory is five years tops, right. you know, they all get and to that, regenerate. They all get to come back. They all get to get quote unquote rehabilitated. <laughs> and the, well, the cycle they, starts the, all over um, again. they just had the, um, you know, Warren Ellis is uh, the, the artist. One of the artists at Warren Ellis work is working with on a series announced that they're going to bring the series back. And it, yep. brought, it brought his kind of uh, conundrum back. Being to the, a bad date. <laughs> he, was, he was a very bad date, Warren. And, um, <laughs> and so, you know, Image put out a statement that they said, we're not going to work with Warren until he's figured out his stuff. And so it sounds like Warren is making some, you know, a, a public effort, you know, to respond to the people who created that website about him. And, you know, do, I mean, I don't, I think people are redeemable. And um, oh, most definitely. And I, I, I I think War, you know, maybe Warren's on that list. You know, people who can be redeemed, it's like possibly the worst date on, on earth. Pretty uh, shitty date. Very, very shitty date. Um, but um, my hope with stuff like that, with men like that, is that they will listen. Number one, but number two, make amends, come back from it. Every there has time- to be a path back, right? Exactly. They got to work, but if we don't give people a path back, that all it does is reinforce their shitty uh, attitude. And if you exclude them from society, it gives them no reason to come back to it, you know, or be a productive member of society or however you want to phrase it. Um, And that's what I, I hate about cancel culture. We need to punish people that have harmed others uh, and or society in any way, but uh, we can't just, what are you, they just supposed to exist and have no life for the rest of their lives? They got to have a path back. Well, the thing about like, quote unquote, cancel culture, first of all, is white people took this shit from black people because black people had cancel culture. They would cancel somebody when it would like, it, that was necessary. I said that person- in an obtuse, ignorant way, by the way. I'm just saying no, no, no. when we... We remove people from society yeah. forever. I don't yeah. think that's the answer unless they're true, true, truly monstrous and let harming me, society. Wait, let me break it down. This apology. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't uh, using... I'm pretty ignorant in the vernacular of things. So you're you're not, what, though. No, no, you're not. You're not. This is just... Let me... Because I think we're, we're both on the exact same page. Okay. This is something that black people would do as a necessity for safety the, you know this person over here makes us unsafe they are whatever whatever you know part of the 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 power structure and they are abusive so we have to cancel them for our own survival white people especially extremely left now i'm pretty fucking left I'm, I'm as left as they come, but there are people even further left than me who are so left, they are on the right. And they like to take it for shits and giggles and end people. And yeah, that I don't understand not, that motivation, Tess. I, yeah, I it's, get it's, 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 we got seven billion people on this planet. There's going to be variation. Yeah. But what is in you that's making you do that? It's anti-society and anti-human. It's Lord of the Flies. Yeah. Ah. It's fucking Lord of the Flies. And this is why from day goddamn one, I would go to dudes who had had call outs and be like, bro, this is how you come back. This is what you do. This is how you be part of the solution. Don't lose all the work you've done. Come back. And inevitably, of course, they would be like, fuck you. You know, suck a dick. I'm going <laughs> to do what I want. Okay. Fair enough, but there are a few dudes who I've managed to be in their corner and be like, "Look, stick around. 
don't leave. You know, you're, yeah. you're we're, we're a human fucking family. You know, yeah, you fucked up, but you can come back from this. I don't believe your heart is is black. Like, come on. And there have been dudes who have come back, who have rehabilitated, who have been cool. And they're not accepted a lot of the time. There's still that faction of people who want to want them ended no matter what. Like there this was endless guy. punishment, almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't, but you can I don't survive that. that. Tess, okay. this is amazing uh, perspective because you know, you know me. I'm I'm just a big, giant, pasty white guy, so I have to check myself quite a lot when people are talking because it's really easy for me in this position to just talk out of school. Um, oh. And I don't want to offend anyone when it comes to that type of stuff uh, or, or diminish somebody even worse. Well, did you um, see that, did you see that Cosby turned down counseling? Yeah, because he doesn't need it at all. Huh? I mean, uh, he lives it. That's a true example of a monster becoming famous uh, that only am amplifies their monstrosities, you know, and exactly. then he's so lost in his own version of reality. Yep. He doesn't even understand how he may have harmed someone because everybody deserves, you know, to, or has to. Yeah. It's just, it's obviously, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. Uh, uh, megalomania, megalomania at, at like a, a truly psychotic level. Well, yep. he's somebody who I think deserved to be canceled because his his, 100%. Brand, his brand of evil was, I mean, what he was doing to those women was so horrible. I don't think you come back from that. Oh, well, five decades of it? Oh, yeah, yeah. How many victims don't we even know about? You know, and again, like I was saying uh, to Tess before, it's everything is perspective, but he's showing no remorse. Well, then you don't yeah. get to come back, fuckface. Yeah, you know, exactly. you gotta fix yourself so you can be part of society. Moral responsibility is step one, I think. So, but also, like, I'm in a camp that's very unpopular where I don't believe. Do there's there's very few dudes I believe should lose their job, yeah. especially in comics. I just want some kind of. I've always been a proponent of like. I don't believe in the culture of silence. Like, yeah, okay. You can be an abusive piece of shit. You can keep your job and keep working, but I'm going to tell. Yep. I'm going to talk about your ass. And that's so the that price, if, right? If you do something yeah. bad, expect people to talk about it. Exactly. Part of being society, right? It, it's public. You know, I, I, you just got to be ready for everything has a cost, good and bad, and you got to be ready to pay the price, whatever you do yep. exactly. um, in life. And a lot of people like like it both ways, it seems. I want to I be this punk rock person, even though I'm an, uh, uh, a shithead, but I don't want to pay the, the penalty to pay the piper for the things I say unless it brings me money and or fame. Exactly. You know? And it's uh, and you there's a lot of misfirings going on with how people are processing objective reality. It seems uh, and what's important. Did you guys see the social dilemma uh, documentary? Uh, no. no, I've been told to, to uh, it's watch it. It's like Netflix or something, right? It's fantastic. It's yeah, fantastic. I mean, it's terrifying. It's scary, and it get it really gets to the heart of a lot of the, the things we've been talking about today. Yeah, and how these Little these little um, incel cabals are formed. Interesting. And how they reinforce each other. Um, I did read a book. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Dr. Chris Ryan. He wrote Sex at Dawn, one of the best books I ever read. Uh, his follow up book to that is called, I think, Civilized to Death or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it goes into our programming as monkeys versus how the world's evolved and how we're yeah. not. It doesn't. You know, we're not emotionally evolved enough to handle the power social media brings and are basically the phones how they're they're programmed to keep us using the phone you know or or yep. whatever that's, portal of that uh that's the, we, thrust of the, that's the thrust of the documentary <laughs> exactly but no my mom grew up in uh 
in the boonies, man. She was up in Auburn, Placer County, Northern California. And she grew up with an outhouse, you know, no, no uh, uh, running water in the house. Um, if you had to go pee pee at night, you did it in a jar on the porch, but it was a screened in porch. So the, you know, the mountain lions didn't supposed carry to do you that off. anymore. Ha ha ha. <laughs> um, but talking to her, I've been researching her childhood. Um, she was kidnapped <gasps> by her father uh, when she was 12. Now, he, they, now they just call that vacation. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, she has had two little brothers. She was 12, little brother 10, little brother 5. Dad came from Missouri. And uh, she was with her grandparents. My grandma had gone to go get bicycles for Christmas. This was in October. He came with his brother and his brother-in-law. Now, these were some deep backwoods, hardcore hillbillies. They came in an old Buick. It was 1959. And when they reached in to give them, you know, their presents, uh, my Uncle John went to reach for his and... His father grabbed him by the arm, grabbed my mom, and started dragging them out the front door. Yeah. And yeah, it was hardcore. Mom wrenched free. He got my uncles. And then the mean uncle, uh, the her uncle, she went in to hide in the shower and he busted in the house. Uh, they threw my great grandfather out of his wheelchair on the front porch. Holy shit. Grabbed my mom threw her over his shoulder, left, threw her in the car, took her to Missouri. They were gone for a month or more. And I've been researching this story because it was in the local papers and stuff. So I've been talking to the Library of Congress, trying to get, you know, because this is going in the comic. Of course. Oh, I think I saw that. I think I saw you researching that on Twitter. Yeah. And it's been such a wild journey to realize exactly how they lived and what they survived through. So wow. that's what's in my blood, man. Survivors, you know, uh, uh, living in the backwoods. And I mean, my mom used to run wild. My mom was a wild child. My uncles were wild children. Uh, my great grandma was, you know, chopping the heads off chickens and she, they grew, oh God, like there's so many stories. I found out my great grandfather was related to um, the founders of the Cells Circus huh. from back in the day. Um, that was his cousin. Ooh, wow. I, yeah. My, what, let's see, my great great grandfather, his parents died on a wagon train out west, and him and his little brother were adopted. They didn't even, we couldn't find their real last name. Wow. Um, yes. Yeah, so I have that problem with my family, by the way. Really? I, I'm about as Norwegian and uh, Scandinavian as it gets, just basically Norwegian and German. And uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. My grandfather's father came home, found his wife banging a dude. He shot them both dead and then shot himself. And then wow. uh, his, uh, his aunt took him in who had married a British guy. And that's why I have a British last name, even though I'm I'm a product of uh, I don't know just endless decades of Viking cum and boats. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> JC Man, comes from sense, horse though. thieves. He has a great uh, he has a great story about that. But wow. yeah, I had uh, I had crazy family too. You know, while my grandfather went to the Korean War, my dad was like eight and basically ran the farm in South Dakota. You know, wow. with like an outhouse. He didn't even have running water till he played the high school football. And they allowed him to use the uh, uh, showers in there. So that was like his first shower when he was in high school football. Wow. And, uh, but that was like bumfuck uh, South Dakota, you know, just grass and nothing. So anyways, there's like this history book with my great great grandfather who came here in like 1896 and took a train till he got the free land in south dakota and then he just had a grass hut in the middle of south dakota and i guess banged uh, desperate farm ladies i don't know how the rest of the story went but uh 
Uh, regardless, yeah, so I had a nutty, as far as uh, old hardcore family members that just aren't part of society, I come from that. What about you, Tess? You, having uh, tasted uh, the real mortality, potential mor uh, mortality, what's your position on uh, uh, stuff outside of objective reality? The metaphysical. Yes. Um, I, I have always been reluctantly spiritual but very anti-religious um like as a hobby i've studied fund fundamentalist uh polygamy american mm -hmm. polygamy and you know where th that's how i know about how they promise you a planet and all that kind of stuff um but i have more recently because of cancer because of going through all that i said you know what i'm gonna read all the quote unquote like holy books yeah. I'm just going to do it. So I read the Book of Mormon. That's a I'm wild ride. Yep. Very. And I am currently working on uh, reading the Bible and illustrating it. Wow. That's how I got into comics, uh, Tess. How? Is, uh, illustrating the story of Moses for uh, the American Bible Association. Ah. Uh, they gave me a bag of money and I put a down payment on my, that's how we got my wife's hospital. We we're able to afford it. Um, and then I was at San Diego comic con doing it. And someone just asked me, you know, uh, a question. And I was like, nah, I'm an atheist. And, uh, that did not go over well. No. Um, but you know, I am, uh, so they didn't like the truth. And, uh, I, I just didn't understand. It, it's the story of Moses. It's a profound, it's a story. I can tell it. I'm a professional storyteller. Uh, yeah. But they still didn't like that uh, I didn't subscribe to a higher power. Well, I like, I like Tess's, uh, Tess's uh, philosophy. I, I mean, I, in all, I, I'm no joke growing up. Like to me, the force and like listening to those characters talk about how the force works was so much more interesting than anything I heard in Sunday school. <laughs> well, Definitely more positive. You, yeah. Believe in yourself and you can do anything. <laughs> Let me give you my background. Okay, so I'm, um, I, I got maybe 15%, you know, uh, uh, Texas Mexican blood in me. The rest of me, white, white, super white. I come from, you know, white, white hillbillies. But when I was... Okay, how do I how do I explain this nicely if my mom listens to this? Okay. <laughs> my mom had four kids by the time she was like 28. She got married at 19 to a small town boy. And then uh the 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 jury's still out on, on the timeline, but basically I, I was um the milkman's baby. <laughs> but the but the, the milkman, get this, bear with me. The milkman was a con man. Oh, no. Who was pretending to be Pueblo Native American. Oh, no. And he would go from town to town in a little RV and would teach classes to very bored housewives. Ah. Uh, teaching them to make, you know... Ooh, authentic Native American pottery. Oh, well, at least and it like, wasn't dream weavers. Right. He was, making, he was making authentic, authentic love. He was making exactly. authentic. Uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I have way too much. <laughs> I should so, shut up while I'm ahead here. Go, so, go, Tess, carry on. <laughs> he, was, he was a home wrecker of the highest order. Uh, a Professional home wrecker, it sounds like, yeah. huh? Had many children. Um, I, I was one of many. And uh, my mom kept me, but didn't run away in the RV with him. So he left her. And she wound up divorced, uh, raising five of us. One of them left home early, you know, to go get married. But the whole Native American thing on my mother's side, my great grandmother believed she was Native American because she was dark skinned. And uh, so my grandma fixated on, oh, we're part Cherokee. Oh my God, like every other white person. Um, and I grew up going to powwows, not knowing 
that I was not authentically Native American. It was very weird. Interesting. Um, so I grew up with a very spiritual background. I was a dancer. Um, I was. I've seen I, the powwow I, comics before, and they're always wildly interesting because you illustrated your mom too. Um, if I remember correctly, in one of them. Uh, no. I no. have to go back. Didn't you? Uh, I think it was. Was it a drum circle or something? I thought. Yes. I, but regardless, I don't need to tell you what you did. I apologize. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no. But that, that being said, it was really interesting and curious. So this is really fun learning about you and and uh, the story behind that. Yeah. Okay. So powwow kid, that was me starting to deal with the fact that you know I was abused by uh, an older dancer and a drummer, um, two different dudes. And we all grew up around the same drum. Um, my mom didn't fully know everything that was going on, but she also came from a time when you courted. So she believed one of these men was, you know, quote unquote, courting me. Hmm. Um, did not know how badly I had been abused, did not hmm. know all of the things that were going on. Um, but that's my background. Uh, so spiritually that filtered its way in and I always felt a little off about it. Um, no specific spirituality or anything has ever fit me. I always kind of made my own. I definitely have had weird experiences with, um, patterns in life. I believe that that's why I came to the whole force explanation because I believe that life does run in patterns. I believe you can feel people's energy. Like if somebody walks in the room and you have a horrible feeling, yeah. they just give off bad juju, you know, yeah. bad energy. Like Darth Vader. Exactly. Right. I believe in it. I believe in it that way. Not on like a cosmic level, but just a, how nature and plants and animals and humans we we give off a certain amount of uh radio waves yep we do and you believe I, it's radio and it, it's not a combination of pheromones and uh uh micro uh social cues that the person's giving off and uh i'm i'm with tess i had a boss that i worked with and just the second he walked in the room it was like it was almost like a shadow just came over over everything. I mean, there was just something yeah. so dark about that to him, to, to the core. He was interesting. Just, yeah. You can you're smell a salesman. It. That's a special type of evil, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was, he was, uh, he was a salesman. You okay. can smell it on people. Yeah. You can. As soon as they walk in the room, you can smell it. Yep. Especially where you are, uh, LA, man. Woo! Yep. Got, you can definitely smell those a-holes as they walk into a room for a pitch meeting or something. Exactly. This guy's all ego. <laughs> get ready. And you just know. You get to a point, especially growing up with, um, you know, a, in a, an abusive household like I did. You know when someone comes in the room and you're about to get hit, you're about to get yelled at, you're about to, whatever it is. You learn that when you're real little. Because it's a safety thing. So of course, now, right? Survival yeah. mechanism. Yep. Exactly. So now mine's super heightened. You know, it's even more so. But also, I do believe shit happens for a reason. I don't know why. I, no, I don't believe there's, you know, a, a god per se. But I do believe that things happen like uh, my husband just came in and was like, holy shit. Yeah, here's what I'm working on. Yeah, you're crushing it there, Tess. I bounce around. Um, but no, I don't believe there's, you know, necessarily some almighty God who's up there telling everybody what to do and has a set of rules. But I do believe in patterns of life, patterns of the universe, because it's happened in my life. Um, what do you mean by patterns? Like uh, noticeable repetition? I, uh, I mean, like... I knew I was going to get cancer. I knew because when my grandmother had it, my grandmother had breast cancer. I distinctly remember it. She took me in the bathroom, showed me her, she had a, a single mastectomy or, you know, had her, her left breast removed. And she showed me how to test myself because she said, it's coming. Oh, yeah. It's coming for you. 
And when it comes, you'll know what to do. This will save your life. And I don't know. Grandma wasn't, you know, mystical or anything like that. Grandma was as atheist as they come. But she knew. And therefore, I knew. Um, so when it happened, I knew the test was going to come back positive. I knew what it was as soon as I felt the lump. And I accepted it because I'd been preparing for it my entire life. And it's things like that where you just know things. You feel it in the moment. Okay, that's truth. Okay, yeah, this is coming for me. You know when relation. I know when relationships will fail. I know when business situations or, you know, comic book situations are doomed to fail um, before they even start. And it's a rhythm. It's a pattern. It's a, uh, I don't, I don't want to be cliche and call it the music of life, but if you open your ears and you're an open human being, you can hear it. You can not predict the future. Cause that's fuck that shit. Um, but if you are intuitive, if you are open, if you are essentially a, a, what do you call it? Um, intuitive. A, a, re a receptor. Yeah. If you can receive, don't cut the flow of energy off. You can be at peace with the world. You can go with the flow of life's river instead of fighting against it. Does that make sense? Yep. Absolutely that it does. I just yeah. don't understand the spiritual as aspect of it. And I'm not going to shit on uh, your thoughts because you said it so eloquently, obviously. Uh, and this is about you. I just, I see all those things as a mix of, intuition and we do have obviously uh more profound uh uh ability to assess uh the environment and then as far as your cancer that's uh, genetics you you go along the lines of there's two uh uh genetic lines of jewish people that are they have the two uh genetic yeah. markers that give them the worst yeah. you probably know this better than me but so you could just say i know i was going to get cancer and then it's verify it. it your ego verifies it because then it happens where i guess i'm too much of the scientific method you have to establish the causality of things um outside of intuition and that's why we came up with uh uh well basically how science comes about double blind studies because no matter what your ego will always interpret things well, the, the intuition, the fact that her grandmother had the intuition to reveal that to her is But it's also a genetic, well, maybe then, the, I get your point, JC, apologies for stepping on you, I'll let you continue. Well, yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that, I think you get the idea, I mean, it's like, the, I think the most interesting part of that story is that the grandmother, like, she, I'm sure her grandmother didn't know anything about, about how this is passed down generationally, or maybe she did, but... Nope. Um, there's a lot of things with intuition. You show a baby a snake and they'll have a recoil action yes. through countless, countless, countless generations of snakes fucking killing us while we were, you know, monkeys turning over rocks. Um, so I, all I'm saying is I, I have to see verification and study of something rather than assumptiveness, if that makes sense. However, I absolutely respect when somebody like you or Tess says something because I respect you as people and I have to listen, right? Because if I close my mind, then I'm just as bad as uh, the people that upset me in this, this society. And I think that's <laughs> shitty. Well, Tess, so, is, Tess is a Tom Waits fan. And um, big I know Tom Waits. I didn't know that, Tess. Misery's the river of the world, right? Fuck yes. Well, ah, um, I knew I, I, I was in the, uh, anyways, go, go, go. There's a great Tom Waits interview where he talks about there was some outfit, there was a, there was a nuclear, there was some sort of nuclear place where it was unbelievably dangerous to be near. Maybe it was Chernobyl or something like that. And so they had to hire these artists to create an image that was so universal, that you would, would, would universally say, this is horrible, stay away, even to an alien race. And so they had to come up with iconography to put around, I don't. I think it was Chernobyl, to put around Chernobyl. So even if the human race became extinct and some other race showed up, there would be a sign there 
that would be that would be couldn't be mistaken for anything other than go, go away. There's danger here. Yeah. Did, you know, there's a, it's a great Tom Waits interview. I think it was maybe with uh, the Onion or something like that. I read maybe. that in Discover actually. So you're a hundred percent right about that. Yeah. They had like if civilization ends, they had to make a sign that the this person wandering up would know. Okay, don't go here. So I, I think it's a picture of uh, Yoda's melted cloaca. I hate you. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> I'm, hey, I'm, have you guys seen the Mandalorian? You should see the Mandalorian. Listen, oh my god! A cloaca has just as much uh, has just as much a right to exist as a as a. Uh, Penis or a vagina, you know. <laughs> hey, hey, even more. It was here first. <laughs> I, I, there was another term I'd heard for that. It was called a fatigus, but I've never heard cloaca. Yeah, that's a porn Thanksgiving, dude. Scientists don't recognize that terminology. <laughs> so, so is this what I was missing out on all these years, not being part of the boys club? This is like... This, well, this, this is the boys <laughs> club when they're not completely evil. That's right. <laughs> You just talk about buttholes. <laughs> Funny that it's not too far off from what I end up talking about every day. So let's talk fictional buttholes. Green Yoda butts. We need Green to know. Yoda butts. <laughs> I'm losing everything. I, we here. all need to sleep at night, so it's high time we uh, solve this. Does does um, <laughs> does Chewbacca have a cloaca? <laughs> no, he's a mammal. Okay, all right. He's got a big old distended butthole, though. <laughs> Years of poor dieting. I know him. Wait, I wait, see wait, him wait, 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 wait. Why is it distended? Yeah, well, he's always, like, <laughs> yelping and making... He probably can talk normally, but he's in <laughs> extreme pain from his distended butthole flapping when he's running around with his crossbow trying to keep up with Han Solo. So I, I need I need some scientific. Uh, oh, uh, that's just a feeling I have, Tess. <laughs> you know, I opened my ears up to tobacco buttholes, and <laughs> it came back that this was, you know, it just felt right. So uh, <laughs> what about? Jack? I don't want to live in a world where Chewbacca does not have a distended butthole. I don't know about you. You just, you just felt that this was the case. You felt his pain intuitively. I can, and, yeah, and I just no scientific backup. I got there's it. There's a I got disturbance it. in the cloaca. There's, <laughs> <laughs> I can feel the disturbance in the cloaca. Which can <laughs> happen from eating too much chipotles, but this time it's not. <laughs> oh my god! I just god. wonder what what job is working with. You know, is he a cloaca? I mean, he would have to. He's a worm, right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He seemed pretty into uh, Princess Leia. You know. Hey. Uh, who knows what? Maybe he's uh, wants something stuffed in his cloaca. I don't know. <laughs> this is uh, a long, long time ago. So who knows what they were into? It's a galaxy far, far away. Giant, giant laughing grub cloaca or little baby Yoda cloaca? I mean, he's 80, so it's not like you have to worry about uh, no. any intergalactic legal issues. <laughs> no. Oh, here we go. Oh, well, here we go. <laughs> I mean, now we're going to have to talk about Morgan Freeman marrying his niece. I mean, the whole thing is just going sideways. My wife used to work on his horse uh, back in vet school. Was he, uh, had he yet, uh, had he yet had uh, relations with his niece or step? Uh, I don't know. I don't think then his big story was he crashed in Mississippi when we were there. And like his uh, uh, mistress was in the car and that became a big story. Right. So I don't know. When I you talk like that. Of this. It's been, it was so hush hush, but you can Google it. Yeah, he's had some, you know, as much as you like him, it, it, it makes, I don't know. Do you ever avoid certain things just because you like the person? Love is blind sometimes. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big Alec Baldwin fan, so I have to close my eyes a lot. From screaming at his daughter and shit? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Running down the street, punching people in the face <laughs> for saying hi? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I have a new um, penchant for uh, some pretty terrible reality TV drama. So, Ooh. Oh, what's your, what's your poison there, Tess? Uh, don't judge me. 90 Day Fiance. Ooh. That's my wife's jam! She's, <laughs> a, she's an Ivy League doctor, and all she wants to do when she gets home from opening animals and closing them is watching these doofuses 
desperately okay. marry each other. It's so good, though. It's oh, so shoot. I, I have to watch it by default sometimes when I come upstairs. And uh, I get it while, why people are, it's crack, right? It's just, it is. it's true voyeurism. It uh, so is. My uh, husband and I watch it together. But we also watch, um, because it's LA-based, Shaws of Sunset. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen it. Oh, I know what you're talking about. I had a buddy, I think, that worked as uh, production on that show. Oh, God. It's so good. But I'm also extremely in favor of um, – how do I put this nicely and professionally? Um, beautiful people watching? Mm. Is that yeah, a nice That's just part of voyeurism. That? The prettiest monkey? Man, I'd let Brad Pitt fuck me. And I'm not even <laughs> remotely gay. Just sorry, buddy. He's too good – Sorry, I just stare at him while he is kissing me. Well, I'm I'm very um into girls. Uh and I tend to be a little how do I put this nicely? Um I like looking at titties and there's a lot of titties on that show. That's the only way I know how to so uh, it. On 90 Day Fiance? No, Shaws of Sunset. Oh, I was going to say, what have I been watching when my wife shows me that shit? 90 so, uh, Day Fiance, there's a little bit, but Shaws of Sunset, oh my god. Just teen It's just like, how is this on TV? How do you look like that? And it's as an artist, especially, it's just, it's the best kind of eye candy. It's the best kind of ju eye junk food. Oh god. It's worth it, just put it on mute. See, I'm a you butt guy. I, that, that stuff does nothing to me, but... Uh... Oh You're well. So no shots. Is there a butt version of Shaws the Sunset? Oh, What's no, up with watch that? Just watch the bottom of the screen. You're good. It's 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 booties too. There's it's so much butt. Too? It's booties too. Oh god. It's all That's butt. My... All butt all the time. Yes, my husband's the same way. There's so much booty. Oh my god. It's yeah, I got a nice butt. Is hypnotizing to me, man. Same, same. Well, I live in Los Angeles, so. There's all kinds of booty on the street out down here. A lot of things to look at in LA just going to get coffee. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and and we're deep into, you know, the yoga pants season. Yeah. So just so, like, God bless you, ma'am. God bless yeah. you for leaving the house looking like that today. Shake what your mama gave you. Exactly. That's what I do, and that's how I got so far. Um <laughs> That's what people say. How did he get so successful? And then I just flash a little ass cheek and a little pump, bunk, and it makes a little bling sound. And then they just hand me cash. Yep. I've been doing it all wrong, man. Tess, can yep. you can you pitch a show for me in L.A.? Pitch a show? Of course. Oh, please. I have, I have an idea for a reality show. Uh oh, what do we got? Did, Zach, did I tell you about my idea for the show? It's called The Blind Bachelor. Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay. Just so you know. Oh, no. Tess, I want to do a show. It's just like The Bachelor, <laughs> except he wears a blindfold, and some of the girls are pretty, and some of them are not as pretty. And at the end, you know, he makes he chooses the girl purely based on personality because he doesn't actually get to physically see them. Uh huh. And then in the final episode, they reveal whether he was whether he was actually just blindfolded but could see, or was actually blind. <laughs> <laughs> And it's just called The Blind Bachelor. It's just like The Bachelor, except he's blind or not blind. <laughs> and, 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 and some of the girls are pretty and some of the girls are ugly. Get some. <laughs> so we're going to we're going to do like a like a Brienne of Tarth, um, yes. Jamie, Jamie Lannister Jamie kind Lannister. of situation. <laughs> yep. They, well, but the thing is, he like picks the hot chick and then she smiles and she has a dead tooth. So this is a real, real dark second twist. I think I think the blind bachelor has legs, baby. I think the blind bachelor could. Although the blind people would probably get pissed, but. Well, but the thing you're totally the blind missing. bachelor. That's you just changed the name. Now you're PC, bro. What, what's it called? The what? The blindfolded bachelor. Oh, the blindfolded bachelor. Now we're getting. Now we're getting somewhere. That's better. That's better. They can't better. get on you then. Anyways, Tess, that's your assignment. You know, as you're out, uh, you're out. <laughs> I know, I know. Like, you're, yes. you're missing yes. the fucking money maker here. The money maker ah. is having comic book artists in a reality show. Yes. Oh. 
you shove them all in a house together and give them all the same deadline. Oh, interesting. That's the well, show, man. So you what the fuck is my point on the show, then? Yeah, you would just call the show Zach Loses. <laughs> Zach, well, the whole thing Zach is to picks up like a hobby that. besides drawing. <laughs> <laughs> Zach quits. <laughs> the show. <laughs> that would be it. And tonight's Zach episode, burned the house down. Zach gets beaten by Ron Lim. <laughs> Within an inch of his life. <laughs> oh, man. It's yeah, I guess I've never given a... Well, I used to give a shit about deadlines, but then I... Uh, had severe health problems, and I kind of reevaluated my life. And I, Same. you know, uh, now I just do whatever the fuck I want every day of my life, and it somehow works out. Same. Yeah, isn't that awesome? That lesson. Put me, put me in the ER enough times, and I'm done. Yeah, I didn't. I just stopped giving a fuck. What do you have to say about? Well, shut up. I don't fucking care. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about any of you. Shut up. Health, the Shut health up. issue puts everything in, in everything in perspective. Yep. You only got one life. I'm not going to waste it with drama, you know? Especially not a, exactly. not according to the phone call I the other night. Artist drama. For, for, as I understand it, there is, there is life after death, and it's actually quite a party. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I hope you guys are right. I don't know shit about anything before well, I get enough hate mail. I didn't say I believed in, in life after death. I said I was spiritual. Yeah. And well, I, I am reluctantly spiritual. I argue about it all of the time. I don't like it. I don't like the fact that my gut instinct is that the universe does have rhythms. The universe does have energies. It's not something I'm comfortable with. I definitely don't believe in a higher power. I don't know if I believe in life after death as we... Like, if I died, I could come back in your dream and talk to you. But I have had dreams, like, where somebody comes back and talks to me, and it's so real, I wake up sobbing, you know? And I am as logical and pragmatic as they come, but that shit has still happened, and it has still made me question. So I have questions, I have curiosities, I have... You know, I work best in life when I accept that the universe has, you know, that I have a destiny. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to hear the lamentations that. of a woman, right? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Tess, have you ever said this is the way? All the time. <laughs> then you're a Mandalorian. That's your religion. Now, wait. Now, wait. Now, wait. Oh, we're going serious, nerd guys. No, I'll be over no, here. Listen. Listen. <laughs> My husband, I told you, my husband, when I met him, he was dressed up like Boba Fett. Right. Right? And that was that was his thing. That that was, you know, he was very much an unfeeling mercenary when we met. Um, as many men are. Um, but he has gone through so many growth spurts, you know, accepting himself, growing as a man, as a person. When he watched Mandalorian he identified with it so fucking hard cool he, you know because he's an artist too he's a storyteller too he does comics too yeah. um we speak that same kind of language so when he watched oh, I'm a little bug. when he watched it it was spiritual for him it actually took him back into making costumes the beautiful um, magic of just being lost in an ip and it just you know that Really, only good storytelling can give you, right? Exactly. So it becomes part went, of your ethos almost. Like he went, and while I was going through chemo, the thing that helped him survive it was he started making Mando armor. Cool. Super and cool. And then he figured out he was going to make me armorer armor. You know, the, the chick with the big hammer? Yeah. In Mandalorian. I got a, an armor helmet sitting in the bedroom. And so we decided, okay, you know what? Fuck it. We're going to go and, you know, if you survive, if I survive this, we're going to go to hospitals and we're going to wear these costumes and oh, we're going to, cool. you know, do charity. Like, this shit matters. And even though fanboys fuck it up, 
a lot of times and can make you bitter and make you not like it, good storytelling can bring you back. That's why I believe in in the art of making comics. I, I do believe this is a, a holy, sacred kind of an endeavor. I really do. Like It's definitely and, sacred to me. I mean, it. I take it more seriously than anyone I've ever met. You know, the medium. And that's been my problem yeah. in life, in my well, you career. Never, you never met Barry Windsor Smith? What now? You never met Barry Windsor Smith? Well, I can do it without looking like Beethoven uh, at his later years. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of my problems in comics stemmed from uh, racism long before it stemmed from, you know, sexism. And the, yeah, so that was what they originally came after me for and then tried to character assassinate me for. Um, was because I was saying, you know, hello, like equality. Yeah. Um, but my major, you know, first hubbub, real big hubbub in comics was, you know, me just saying, oh, yeah, that dude that you're talking shit about. Um, yeah, he tried to get me up to his hotel room once and that made me a pariah. But the thing that truly set them off was the racism stuff. Mm. And um, I, I went through a, a fiasco many years back with a project I walked away from. I just out and out was like, fuck y'all, I'm out. Um, and it was uh, an artist who had beat his wife. Yeah. Mm. Uh, both of them happened to be black. But um, a black woman saying, you know, this happened and being public about it, um, she was considered the angry black woman. You know, how dare you be pissed off? How dare you be upset? Um, children were abandoned. Uh, you know, a, 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 a wife was abandoned with, um, in, in very, uh, with a lot of fireworks. Um, there were br bruises on her. Ugh. It was bad. And the way it was treated uh, was really awful. And I hated it. It was really bad. I stood up for her. You know, she was a friend. But then later on, I found out, you know, that artist was removed from the book. Um, there was a replacement. I was like the second replacement. And I happened to find out that that artist was returning or was rumored to return. They were attempting to bring him back. And I said... Is this true? And if so, I'm out. Yeah. Fucking shit. You know, I'm not going to protect this book just for him to come back to it. And of course, I took a lot of public hits over it. Um, I was called a liar. I was, you know, it was said that was a rumor, whatever, whatever. And I, back in the day, I would be online and say, you know what? It's really, I've been shown evidence. Comics is not fond of black women. You know, all these black women who are saying they can't get hired and, you know, they're treated subhuman. It's true. I know that. Be in 21 years, I, I haven't known uh, black female talent to be hired. Uh, exactly. And that's, odds are unacceptable that there isn't talent out there that, that can fill that void. I mean, um, get, get this, though. I'm going on a rant about that on Twitter about, like, Look, no, this shit is true. This is how I know. Comics hates fucking black women. Like, no. it's not dramatic. You know, I'm not being dramatic. I, I'm not asking for attention. This is just the truth. And literally a minute and a half before I finished this rant, uh, one of the big two emailed me with an <laughs> offer of, hey, would you like to work on this book that's all about black women? This mm. prominent book, where this was like a week before Comic Con, we're gonna drop it at Comic Con. Like your name will be up in lights, all that shit. And I was like, "Are you joking? Are you kidding me? Seriously, you have no black women at all at your company, and you want a white woman to take this revolutionary book, which has a black woman writer? Really? Really? They came at me twice, mm. twice." had me on a conference call for this shit. And I was, I even gave them black artist names. 
here is a list of black women you could have instead of me. You look like an idiot. I'm not gonna lose my fucking integrity. I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is. But after that, it was it was open season on me. Like I got death threats after that. I got called the N word, N word lover. Oh my um, lord! Oh, yeah, that's yeah. where that's where that shit started, man. man yeah, I, like I, I I've had conversations with my old man. I and he used to say, "What percentage of of the of." humanity do you think is is decent you know like do you think 60 percent of people are actually good do you think 80 percent of people are actually good and want to do the right thing and have you know have good, good in their hearts and mm -hmm. the longer i live the smaller that percentage seems to me <laughs> like you also this, have to define what is good you know, you know exactly. people, people who just the golden rule do unto others as you'd have done to you you know just treat people the way you want to be treated People that believe you're asking the percentage of people. It's a great question. Uh, people that actually believe believe that, or people that actually fucking employ that. People impl employ that. Oh shit! I mean, it's kind of every every day. I believe it's a smaller percentage. You know what I I'd mean? I'd say twenty percent of people have the fucking integrity and testicular fortitude to be fucking decent all the time, no matter what the situation yep. provides. You think so, Tess? I, I'd, I'd even hazard maybe about 15%. Wow. You're probably more right because I've met so few people with actually that actually have integrity. They just like to say they're yeah. good people. Yeah. Because well, come they're on, pleasant. In comics. pleasant is good where reality, to your point, Tess, you got to sometimes be unpleasant to move shit forward, i.e. you're yeah. trying to get – a black woman hired for a job about black women, uh, they're giving it to you because if you know, well, she's a female, you know, uh, or whatever their stupid brain. I can just see PR motherfuckers uh, yep. coming up with the reason why, but uh, they just don't get it. But they all describe. I've had editors lie to me and then refuse to admit that the, they won't admit that they lied, even though I have an email chain showed it to them. They know they lied. I know they lied. They won't because they refuse to accept that as part of their character. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah. how are you supposed to be a better person if you don't admit that you're, you fucked up? But there's such a culture in this industry that you never admit wrong that I, I just don't. I may be skewed, but I think I, I want to redo my uh, recalibrate my percentage and get along more along with what uh, Tess said. Wow. I didn't think it was that bad. I, I, maybe I'm too much of an optimist. You don't uh, work in entertainment. It's part of the reason. Um, well, I'm, I'm, that's I'm the work, thing. I'm in, I work with sharks, man. I'm in sales. But, I mean, you don't work with desperate artists and yes. editors who wish they were their failed writers. and uh, it, it gets so murky and ugly. Dude, when I say this industry is Hollywood but ugly and poor, yeah. it is the fucking truth. It's just a bunch of ugly, needy people. The same fucking diseased egos that create actors and actresses. It's the same thing in our industry, except you're ugly and you have less validation and <laughs> usually less money. Um, because there's probably a few good looking comic book artists out there. Sorry, Honestly, what were you saying, Tess? No, let this. The thing that drives me bananas is how many people in comics I've met who are like, I have such integrity, I believe in this, I believe in that, and then big two calls, and it's out All there. gone. Immediately, right? Yep. They're just, they're just cowards. That, uh, I like saying words until somebody offers me money, and then life gets easy. Exactly. Like, what artist in life has ever been like, well, that's remembered, that has a, a big legacy? Name one that was like, well... I'm going to go after the money. Exactly. <laughs> I like things safe. And I exactly. just don't understand what the legacy these fucking pussies are, are trying because to leave. Got, they got a shelf life of five years tops, and then you're going to get forgotten. So what ah, are you even selling out for? You know? Yeah, I what just, are you selling out for? You only get one shot. I just, Fuck. You know, who cares about money anyways? Once your bills are paid, who fucking cares? It's make-believe. It's, make 
It's, exactly. It's not real. You know who <laughs> does care? The Mandalorian. <laughs> this is the I hear that's act. all he slash she thinks about. Come in. Hold on, I've got a visitor. Uh -oh. <laughs> you, a you want to be on TV, honey? No, okay. What do you want? Oh, uh, that's my lead uh, uh, CBD sales rep. <laughs> she did an ad with uh, her, her father that's still my favorite. I'm, nice. talking, I'm talking to Tess and Zach. Say hi, Tess. Hi, Zach. Hi, Tess. Hi, Zach. Hi. Hello. You don't mind? Okay, cool. Can you close the door, honey? Say thank you. Say bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. See, she's one of the good ones. <laughs> she's so good far, she's she's the best one that I've seen. So uh, <laughs> at least today, yeah. I, I just, it's interesting how people are the same and different, you know, throughout realities. Uh, to your point, JC, even you and I have had. Uh, I mean, you're a highly ethical and honest man, but we have very different, probably ethical thoughts about selling art and yeah. and etc oh. you know wait, wait, neither of that. us is right or wrong we lost Tess. excuse me did we, we lose Tess? Tess? we'll so see if she comes back. back what happened hey, there she is i must have been my daughter you? my daughter didn't like you <laughs> <laughs> she was like cancel her <laughs> was like, i don't like that name Tess. <laughs> so, yeah yeah Tess. it's you go by Tess gutierrez now right Tess? <laughs> uh no, work wise I'm I'm still Fowler. Legally okay. my name is Tess Fowler Gutierrez. I kept it. Oh, okay. Uh but yeah, I don't think people I think people want to inherently be good. And yeah. I I think they think they're being watched. They're almost always good. I.e. they find a wallet, they'll yeah. give you a money, they'll try and return it, things like that without taking the fucking money out of it. You know, all yeah. the gross little subtle things that humans do to each other. I think they want to be good. I don't think they have the uh, the thrust, the ability to follow through because their whole lives have been fucking soft. And yeah. uh, they've never taken a chance on themselves so they don't understand how unbelievably important it is to be able to put yourself in a position where you can take a chance on yourself because it's a whole different spectrum of life and i don't even think a career as an artist starts until you've taken a chance on yourself you're just a fucking factory worker until that point i agree i definitely um, agree i'm awesome. real big on honor integrity you know living by your word like i can sleep just fine at night i've walked away from i don't know how many financial opportunities you know work opportunities and if it's not right if it doesn't jive with my ethics or if it preys on somebody else i'm not gonna fucking do it well, that's not... rare and beautiful tess thank you i i, I know just very get called few... a fucking asshole when i do it <laughs> You could be, you'd be so famous, Zach, if you just drew X-Men. And then you tell people you turn down whatever, X-Men or Avengers uh, three times or something like that. And then they think you're a fucking liar. And you're like, well, it just brings me, I know I will fucking be miserable. Can't I just have that? You exactly. Know? And people resent you for it. Then I, I've gotten that at least when they find out I've turned something down. Um, oh, in the early days, man. When my husband found out the first time I turned down a big gig, he was like, what the fuck are you thinking? Ah, we got bills to pay, right? <laughs> yeah, well, not even that, but just he's always been, like, my biggest fan, and he has always wanted me, you know, kind of name up in lights, that kind of shit. Yeah, And it I get took that. him a long time to realize why I was the way I was, and now he's 100% in my camp and you know, has grown in his own right. Like he's gotten past his Han Solo phase and he's very well into his Obi-Wan phase. Um, All which right, is cool. Exactly. Uh, Obi-Wan, Cloaca. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he survived on that desert planet, right? Exactly. <laughs> he could retain water. He didn't have as many orifices uh, dehydrating him. 
Oh, fucking hell. Little known fact. See, look, yours is all pretty and mine is all over the fucking place. <laughs> I, uh, well, one, you, the great thing about this show, you follow your muse, Tess, if, as you've noticed. We have no rules as long as you're not overtly mean to somebody, you know. I mean, Ethan Van Skyver, be as mean as you want. But uh, uh, other than that, uh, uh, you know, we just try to have an open, safe space talk. Be you. And this is the beautiful thing about you. You're fearless, uh, Tess. And I, oh, I like that. Uh, Same. It's Same. so rare. I'm you know just a weird? crazy fuck that everybody's afraid of, which helps me a lot in my thrust as a punk rock artist. But I I know your journey was more arduous than mine, and I so respect that. You know, it's crazy, though. It's crazy because, you know, we were talking about intuition earlier and all that kind of shit. I was drawn to your work before I ever knew anything about you. I go into, you know, wh what I like, it's art first. It's never writing first. And I came into finding your work. I still remember, found it on the comic shelf, just, you know, randomly. Go Which one am I going to work on next? There we go. Mm -hmm. um, randomly looking for stuff and saw the cover and was just like, holy fucking shit. What cover was it? If you don't mind me asking. It was uh, a uh, Wild Blue Yonder. That, oh, okay. I have the name right, right? Okay. My brain goes sometimes with the fucking chemo brain. Um, it's okay. Which one was it, it with her and the dog? I mean, that's like all of them. Well, and that was the one. famous cover, her sitting on her plane with uh, Critter. Yes, 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 yes. Um, saw it, yanked it off the shelf, showed Chris and was like, holy shit. You know, because a lot of comic art, hate to say it, is crappy. Redundant, it's not, too. Yeah. They're all ripping each other off, right? Exactly. And, you know, every great once in a while, you get somebody like you or like uh, Gabriel Rodriguez. Another um, guy he's a buddy of mine. He's genuinely a fantastic human being. He really is. Meeting him was just so much fun. Um one of my all-time favorites. Uh, and but he's a natural so, storyteller. Funny how we're drawn to people like that. <laughs> that's what I mean. I have been drawn to the work of the really cool people in comics, like Gabriel or uh, Fabio Moon huh. and and Gabriel Ba or um, Eduardo Riso. Uh, there's so many dudes who... I found their work and it was life changing. And then you get to meet them in real life and you're like, holy shit. Like you're the real deal. Especially it's when so they're cool. cool people. Like many on the list you just said are good dudes. Yeah. That's intuition, man. That's what I'm talking about. Like well, there's another aspect to it that a person who's mental. Uh, uh, goal or at least uh you know, how they, they conduct themselves and goals as an artist, you pick up on too, because they overlap in the Venn diagram of things you value as well. So exactly. it goes beyond intuition there, I would say even, not intuition's part of it, obviously, but there's a part where it's just, you, your brain picks up that there's overlap there, exactly. you know, and didn't you say, Zach, that you can tell you can tell a lot about an artist's personality by their drawings? I say you can tell 100%. You can tell how they have sex. Yeah. Yep. You can tell what they're attracted to. You can tell if they're liars in life. Everything is right yep. fucking here. Every fucking thing. Are they an interesting person? Do I, I mean, everything. Everything Do they like is right women? there. That's mm. the big one for me. I can tell if a dude doesn't like women. Hands well, they, down by the word. It's going to show in their art, right, Tess? Yep. You can't hide who you are as an artist. The, it, you are what you do. If you are just ripping off Jim Lee drawings, uh, that's it doesn't mean you're a bad person, but that's who you fucking are. You know, if, uh, you know, to Tess's point, if you have some fucked up, you know, uh, philosophy of bigotry or whatever, it's going to come through. It's going to come yeah. through. You don't even have to say it. You just have to be around enough and people can smell it on you. 
You know, yeah. like like B.O. What's the fuck's wrong with this guy? He stinks. You know, exactly. but his artwork's good. That's what I love about, to bring it full circle, that's what I love about Philip Bond. Yeah. That's yeah, what it I love seems about fun. Work. He's a nice guy. Interesting. Of course, had legendary relationships with super talents that are loved forever. And, and MF -er knows how to tell a story, right, Tess? Yep. And he's so underappreciated in his time, man. Oh, like, that is for certain. My rule of thumb with artists is um, I always look for their self-insert characters, their accidental self-insert characters. And Philip, a lot of times, will have himself in his work. Very you much can, so. Yeah, you can totally He'll be in the background. Jamie Hewlett's been in the background of his books. and Yep. You know, all, and that old crew, you know. I love their old pictures. That's one of yeah. my absolute favorite things. Um, the photos of their studio days. And they got fun. St what a group of killers, huh? Yep. Seriously. That was what I always thought comics was, what I always thought would happen. And when it didn't, when I was like the only one, me and Chris, you know, Chris is my favorite person in the world. Um, Cause he's just a good fucking dude. This is, this is a guy who will, you know, help old ladies across the street and, you know, go out of his way, give the shirt off his back. He's that guy. Um, I just, didn't meet a lot of them and then when i met philip i was like oh my god you're a giant cinnamon roll <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> he's just the sweetest and he's married to you know the the mrs Barrett queen herself. there shelly herself there so yeah hardcore cyclone Miss Bauhaus. <laughs> god bless her well, um, absolutely. We need more Shelly Bonds out there in comics. She scares the shit out of me, but I have learned more from her than anyone else in, in comics that I've met, swear to God. Like, I don't know her well. She just has tried to woo me a couple times over to whatever, and that's and she took me out to dinner, her, and I said, well, I'll go out if uh, your husband's coming, and uh, she brought him and took us to an expensive steakhouse, and you know, my <laughs> wife and I are a vegan and a vegetarian so it was kind of that being said one of the greatest uh uh comic book meals i ever had for being uh people trying to woo me legendary man she however steakhouse too. <laughs> yeah well you know that expensive steakhouse across the street it's the start of the gas lamp district in uh san diego it's like right yeah. across the street that's the one we went to <laughs> Oh, so, oh, man, I'm going to tell Shelly. So, are you bringing all your dates here? <laughs> oh, my God. She, sure, I thought I was special, Tess. Uh, no, she should be a Hollywood agent. She well, can woo yeah. like no other. She, uh, she can get your attention. She knows so much. So we're talking punk rock and art and Jamie Hewlett. And then her husband came up and... Uh, because Hewlett was a huge influence of me. Yeah. You know, though it's hard to see my work now. Uh, that was the dude right there, man. Uh, it was just him and Mignola. Right. Yeah, I don't know. It was really cool meeting Philip because I, obviously, through Jamie, then I found all those, that whole crew. And uh, Philip had done a book with Garth Ennis and stuff. And it was really yep. fun to learn about him, man. Yep. And he, he drew, um, actually... He drew my character, Kid Lobotomy. Oh, cool. Pop this that is up, one of my dude. originals. He, oh, I just. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, I have studied him. Like, you know, we all know Jamie. We all love Jamie. We all love Jamie's work. We've all been fucking influenced by him because he was so crazy. But Philip was like the quiet one. And there is such a sense of uh, sweet humor to his work that I cannot get enough of. There is such personality. Um, that's why I was so nervous about inking him. Oh, I yeah. didn't want to override, you know, go over the top of that. But it's also very British. 
there, I didn't realize until I visited England um, just how much I was influenced by the the British cartoonist. Invasion guys. Yeah. I, I it's didn't a different really. type of subtle, uh, very, uh, it lacks ego, their humor, which is very nice. Yeah, it, totally. It's, it's very pleasant to uh, uh, read their books, whether it's you go a little more uh, hardcore irreverent like uh, Jamie did versus Philip Bond, who did a little more subtle, fun character work. You know, yeah. it... it or I don't know how to describe that. His characters, though they're of the same ilk, they feel more tangible to me, if that makes sense. Very much. There's a, uh, the thing I like, what draws me to artists is uh, how they draw women and children. I love the big, you know, the the explosions, the, the teeth, the claws. I love all of that um, more than I probably should. I have a destructive side. But if they can temper that with like stuff like this, uh, that to me speaks to their character. So um, you're looking for balance then in a person. Yes. yes. I agree too. If they just do one thing, I don't trust them. Exactly. Yeah. Do more than one thing, asshole. But that's those are all my favorite kind of artists, you know. Lock and Key, his his work on the the kids grew over time, and it became so amazing. Um, because he started out doing that Clive Barker stuff, and it was a little yeah. Creepy. In fact, that's what uh, when I was big at IDW, that's what he was first ushered in on. He's like a fucking architect or something, and yep. uh, it was early. He was trying comic books. It was really fun to see. He's actually nervous. You could tell the first time he met me, which is hilarious, because now how famous he is and everything. But uh, uh, yeah, Gabe's the shit, right? He is. I got to see him hit the red carpet for the premiere cool. of Lock and Key. Um, I I actually went and they were giving away tickets, so I was right there next to the entrance. Got to see him and uh, uh, Joe and, and Kyle and. Yeah, Talk about a good group you. of people, man. Joe Hill taught me more about being a professional, teaching me. He really taught me how to interact with fans. Cause, uh, really? Oh, yeah. Because I was signing with him for the Cape when it was red hot. And, uh, you know, we became buddies, and you know, as much as you can with a superstar. And uh, uh, watching him interact with lines of hundreds, like 300 people, and he made every single one of every single person person feel special. And I'm not exaggerating. If they had a, a crown of thorns on their head, he would like take it off, put it on his head. And if they had a drawing, he'd love it. And everybody went away. Just feel you could just see they felt special. Like they had a special interaction with that person. And it took very little. I mean, it takes effort, as you well know, but you could just see Joe was fine. You know, it, it didn't yeah. hurt to be a wonderful person. And uh, that's what I, I take away from, from Joe Hill is this guy has no reason to be nice. He's never had an issue with money. His, his fame is paramount, and et cetera. And here he is giving his time to everyone. Everyone. Yeah. Every single fucking person. Hundreds. And whether he's tired or not, he didn't, he didn't, let them see him sweat. I thought it was a beautiful thing. That's so cool. All right, I'm gonna tell you straight up. Chris Ryle is probably like top of my list of trustworthy people in comics. You choose like, wisely. That dude. Um, I, I hope I'm not like talking out of school to say it, but when I was telling you about you know, being afraid at a convention and having to get somebody over, uh, undercover. Yeah. That that dude went above and beyond and even um, chased one of the guys down. Well, there you go. Isn't, like, Ryle, Ryle is the best person in comics. I'll just say it. I, I There's no greater agree. human. I, I definitely have to agree. That guy's had my back on so many occasions and just I I would catch a bullet for him. Like I know the feeling. 
Yeah. Um, I did his first comic book. Really? Yes. Uh, when I quit uh, Batman and my quote unquote career was over, I did one last show and I was just going to sell all my shit. And he came wandering up as like day two of uh, uh, being the, he replaced Jeff Marriott, uh, Marriott or whatever, uh, as uh, editor in chief. Didn't give a fuck. I was going to go like into teaching or whatever nonsense. Yeah. And uh, he just came up. He's like, will you do a zombie book with me? And uh, he just caught me on a good moment. And I was like, oh, fuck it. I'll go back to Indy. I started with Indy. I'll do one more indie book. And it ended up being Shaun of the Dead. And I kind of taught him about pacing. Uh, and we just became good friends after that. I did his first <laughs> so book. And cool. we've been very good friends ever since. We do pitches hey. together. We're, all of my books are going to be going through his imprint from now on. Uh, That's so, cool. so, you know, we got to figure out logistics of that. But it's Ryle, so he gets rights of first refusal. He's literally one of my best friends in the history of the, I mean, shit, I've been working with him since 2004. So I just realized that's right. You did do Shaun of the Dead. That's where I saw your work first. Ah, he let me. A, oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, no, I was a huge Shaun of the Dead fan. So I had to pick it up and freaked out, completely freaked out. And I was I, like looking at it. I remember sitting there and studying it and going, I'm going to be this good one day. <laughs> well, first honored. Second, the reason I ultimately took the job is because Chris Ryle, I was just coming off a of Batman with being forced with just an inker that did not work with me. Uh, he just said I could do whatever I wanted. And so he literally let me learn how to ink while uh, doing Shaun of the Dead. Uh, that's and so that's, cool. That was my first real professional gig outside of uh, the occasional image crap uh, that I started with that I inked myself. And you can really see, you know, throughout it, Murphy jumped on after a while because I, I uh, injured my back training for rugby and uh, he had to do some inking on it and stuff like that. So you get to see a lot of our early madness together. Um, that's so cool. Yeah, but yeah, we'll... Uh, well, Chris Ryle, yeah, he, I mean, it was all him. He wooed me, but, uh, uh, yeah, did his first book. So, and we've been buddies ever since, probably to his uh, dismay. <laughs> <laughs> He's had to come between me and people at IDW before, which hadn't have been, couldn't have been fun, having to stand between me and a motherfucker. I want to chip his teeth out of his head. He is a good, good man. Anything else you want to get out here, uh, Tess, before we wrap up? You, you, just, you have been an absolutely amazing guest and a joy to have on with such a fresh perspective and uh, self-actualized you know, philosophy. It's just brilliant and wonderful, and thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's been really fun. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we got to do this. Um, just Anybody listening can follow me on Twitter and it's just Tess Fowler, T-E-S-S-F-O-W-L-E-R or on Instagram, uh, same name, just add a number seven at the end. I will be, I will be following you with relish from now on. <laughs> right on, man, thanks. He means actual relish. He sits in a yeah. tub of relish when he starts, uh, goes through his Instagram followers. Yeah. That's how you keep your, uh, what is it, co co Calacula clean, right? <laughs> Cloaca. 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 So you, you pee and poop out the same hole, which I think people in Connecticut do, right, uh, Jason? Yeah, as, as long as, if you use enough relish, it works. <laughs> That's it. All right, guys. <laughs> There's never not, you can't use too much relish. Lots of love, lots of love, guys. Thank you so much, Tess, for coming. And uh, Zach, I will see you soon. Absolutely, sir. Love all the fans. Uh, check Tess out. Absolutely, absolutely one of my favorite talents for multiple reasons in this industry. And we barely know each other. So I think that says a lot. She's hell of a story, <laughs> hell of a talent. Go check her out. Uh, big ups to everyone. JC, hope you and your family are okay, and uh, we'll see y'all in two weeks. See you guys. Same. Love you guys. Take it easy. <laughs>